Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Pastor James Brooks, and thank you so much for watching this video. As always, it is my prayer that the words that I may say today, that the Lord may use them to make your life better, to help you walk with Jesus Christ with more sincerity, more uh, faithfulness, and a greater desire and passion in all that you do for his kingdom. Before we go any further, let me please ask you once again, try to spread this message and get it out by clicking the share button down below. Those friends that are on your list will be able to see it and they can decide for themselves whether they feel the Lord calling them to listen or not. And we can just trust one another that the Lord has a great work to do through me and through you. And I ask you to be a part of that. Also click the like button. I don't know why, I just hear all, all the other content creators saying that, but definitely the share button, and mostly that we can trust that the Lord Jesus Christ can reach people in a great need. Before me, you can see I have a, a small little scales here, balances, and I had a, a nice presentation with a different set of scales, but they were green, and they would blend in with the green screen, so I had to drop it. But these scales here, uh, it represent, I want to give us a balanced view on something normally looked at in a very negative light. And if you've walked with the Lord in any given uh, length of time, I'm sure that you've been misunderstood. Even something that you've done good, somebody took it the wrong way. Do you remember when David was bringing food up to his brothers at the battlefield? And his oldest brother said he was only there so he could gawk and look at the, look at the fighting and stuff. And David was like, Dad told me to come. I was just bringing food for you guys. But his older brother uh, cast on him something that wasn't in David's heart. I want to talk about something on these pieces of paper. You can see it from me. Faith and, faith and uh, anxiety. And I want to give a proper balanced view because, you know, we walk in this world. And there are plenty of darts and arrows and uh, objects that come at us in life and can batter us around from the left uh, to the right to be behind us and before us. There is a lot of cares in this life. And often we look at anxiety or this word that I'm going to discuss and we only see it in the negative light. And there are a couple of teachings by Jesus and parables that do shed light on that, but it is not the full counsel of scripture. And that is one of the things that we must be always careful as God's people is to give the full counsel of Scripture not just one verse and browbeat somebody or a congregation or someone who doesn't come to church or God forbid even our brother and sister on the pew with us because we have a, a wrong understanding or at least a limited understanding so I want to talk about this word here anxiety and I want to give us some biblical understanding that this word uh, used in the New Testament is larger than the normal phrase that we use. As you know, there is over 40 million people right now that are suffering from some form of anxiety, usually from ages 18 and up. Uh, I think that average is about 15 to 25 percent for those 13 to 18. But a large number of people suffer from anxiety in a medical condition in a very demonstrable way. And even reading recently the rising suicide rates that have occurred during this uh, COVID period, uh, we need to hear some good news and we need to properly understand what's going on. So I want to talk about our faith and talk about anxiety and give a balance. Uh, not to lift one up and say the other one shouldn't be there or to focus so much on the other that our faith has no purpose or bearing in the way that we live. And surely it should, because we're trying to live before men a life that would draw them to know Jesus Christ. So let's go to a popular verse. This is from Philippians chapter 4, and this is verses 4 through 7. I know you've heard this verse before, so let us look at it. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everybody. And that's what I would like to do is be reasonable about what we're understanding today. The Lord is at hand. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. The teaching today, what I'm going to discuss, I hope will guard your hearts and your minds, and that the peace of God can reign therein. But we must look at this command that is given, where it says, do not be anxious about anything. And naturally, we look at the word anxiety or anxiousness in such a negative light. And I want to give uh, more clarity to this word anxious. It comes from, there are two Greek words the bear the same root, marinam and marinama. These are the Greek words. And these words uh, are used in a vast array. Some would say in a positive way and some in a negative way. Or let's say it has a broader usage than just simply the negative way. And I want to look at some of the words or how it's been used in other texts besides the Bible. You know, the Bible is not the only book that was written in Greek, or at least the New Testament I speak of. There are many other writings that were written around the time of the Bible and use this very word. And so we can see the broad spectrum of what this word means. In uh, Sophocles' play, one of the gentlemen is asking another gentleman, he asked him this question, Herdsman, in what labor or in what way of life are you employed? This way of life of an employment is marina, meaning what is it that your mind or your being is fixed on? What is it that is your occupation? What is it that you do daily? That word is the word that we use for anxiousness. So we can already see it's used in a positive way right there. What is it you do? What is it that's your livelihood? What is it that, that is your employment? What is it that your mind goes to? And in this context, well, I herd sheep or I watch over goats or whatever it might be. So that's one use of the term. We find it also used with another word, lupe, at the end of it, which is used by a... Um, by a lady that's weeping at the shrine and asked, how came thou lady near such a load of care? Now we see this word may be used in a more grievous sense. It's the same word, but now she has a grief on her heart and a burden, so to speak, on her mind. And again, this may or may not be a good thing. Sometimes when someone passes away, surely grief is something that is very natural. Would we scorn somebody or browbeat somebody for, fear, for having grief, for having uh, a sense of loss because they lost a son, a daughter, a mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, or a friend, anybody? We would never do that and would be unconscionable to do that. And I don't think the Word of God tells us to uh, scorn people. So clearly that word for anxiety is not used in that context is used that way either. But let us go to another one. Um, listen to this. This is, uh, in the ordinary Greek, the word merriman can be used to describe a man thinking about his work or a philosopher puzzling about his problems. A man thinking about his work, which we saw earlier, or puzzling about a problem. You know, think about how many things that we've come to learn to fix because we spend some time in the garage uh, puttering or tinkering around. Why is that carburetor not working? Why can't I get that lawnmower started? What's wrong with my, my uh, engine? Why won't the engine turn over? And next thing you know, we've puzzled it out. We uh, figured out it was maybe the starter or the solenoid or perhaps the battery was dead. But see, that was something in this context we were anxious of. Not anxious like biting our nails or fretful in a sense, but anxious, merriman, in that it took our mental activities. I want us to stop for a moment and look at this passage once again in, uh, in Philippians. What does it say? It says that, that the Lord will guard your hearts and your minds. 
And clearly we're talking about mental activity in these cases, the puzzling out. And the Lord does want us, wants to protect our minds and our heart. And we know even today in psychology, those that suffer from extreme anxiety have uh, what we call mental health issues. And clearly God does want us to have a good mental health. And he can guard us, but we need to understand this word. Let me give you another couple case and points how this word is used. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, Socrates said to uh, Pericles, he says, I think that you take too much trouble, or merriman, meaning anxiety, this word that we're using. You take too much trouble that you may not uh, unconsciously lack any knowledge useful to, gener uh, to the general, uh, to, to a general. So he says you take too much trouble trying to figure out things. Again, employing the mind. This word is broad in its usage. Now I will skip over a couple, but one is a letter who's writing, a lady who's writing to her husband. And she writes to him that she can't sleep at night because she worries or she marimons, meaning that instead of thinking about the carburetor or how to fix the problems or a puzzle, her mind is now going in a way that she's allowing herself to think something bad may happen to her husband, that he may not come home, that he may be injured in war or battle or lost at sea. She's letting her mind work just like the man who's working at a puzzle or his employment, but in a, now it's taking a kind of a different turn. One mother writes that uh, she uh, that all her praise and all her anxiety or merriment that the Lord answered all her prayers and her anxieties. So we see the word being used that way. A soothsayer warned a client that he will be involved in many anxieties or merriment and distresses. And finally, uh, I can't pronounce this guy's name, Ercion. He says, when I drink wine, my worries or my merriment go to sleep. So clearly we can see often anxiety or something that can plague our minds and also the lady that grieves that it was plaguing, plaguing her heart. And so we want to look rightfully at scripture. We want to look rightfully at how we are to look at this as a Christian. Because you know often we have our faith and uh, we want to believe our faith is stronger than our anxieties. And in this case, you can see that it is. But it doesn't take long. Maybe a, a bill, maybe a sickness, maybe a son or a daughter uh, having issues, perhaps your wife or a husband, perhaps car problems, perhaps even issues in your own body. And next thing you know, that's added to the other side. And now we find ourselves, our faith lacking. Are we terrible Christians at this point? Do we not believe God at this point? What? What are we to do when things of life, the natural things, come our way and naturally our mind is going to go to it? How can we properly or rightfully look at this? I have a couple of ways that I'd like to look at it, let's say in the negative sense, how we should not look positively on anxiety. One is that anxiety and worry which come too much um, in the affairs of the world is always wrong. Meaning when we are so caught up in the ways and the principles of the world that we have anxiety, this is a wrong way to have it. And I'm just going to read what Barclay says here. When a man gets so involved in the things of time that he has no time for the things of eternity, when he, then he is in dangerous position. When he gives so much thought and care and concentration to the things of earth that the things of heaven are crowded out, in a perilous situation. And then finally he says, when a man be so much with men that he has no time with God, he may have many words to say to them, yet he has no time to pray and talk to God. This is a bit dangerous place. When we are more apt to talk to our friends, our family, our loved ones, strangers, we meet them in line at the grocery store, how's it going? Ah, my car broke down. You know, we tell strangers sometimes some things, but yet we don't tell the Lord. And sometimes we think, well, the Lord knows everything, and so I don't need to tell him. 
But I like to think that the Lord is inviting us to speak with him. And so we can be so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. We can be so caught up in the affairs of men that we have no idea of eternity in the things of God. This is when worry is a bad place. When it doesn't bring us to a place of seeking after God, but we are engaged in this world. A second place is when we worry about the future. This is always the wrong place to be. Remember what Jesus said, look at the air, the birds of the air. He says, they don't worry about tomorrow. Yet here we are. And Jesus says, our worry, we can't even change the color of our hair or make one hair stay in or we can't do any of that. And so worrying about tomorrow, things that are out of our control, might as well worry about somebody over in Africa or something that's going to happen 100 years from now. You're just as powerless to change things from 100 years from now than you are to change tomorrow. So it also flies in the face that we need to be willing to face a situation and to trust God. You know, when we worry about tomorrow, it doesn't make us more able to handle the situation. Matter of fact, it makes us less able to handle that situation. And so when we worry about tomorrow, in a sense, we are worrying about whether we can trust God. And that is never a good place to be in. The next place that worry is not a good place is when we worry is wrong when we make a, when we expend our time and our energies on the non-essentials, on things that are not important. You know, there's a, an interesting example that um, happens. I'm going to tie a, a story and a parable in together. The parable of the sower. Jesus uh, talks about the sower laying out the seed. And some of the seed falls on the thorns. And the thorns chokes it out because of the cares of this world. See, the anxieties. It chokes it out and it can't bear good fruit. And that interesting, that word for good, that portion, is used in another story. It's used in a case where Mary and Martha are together. And Martha is upset that Mary is listening to Jesus instead of being in the kitchen. See, Martha allowed herself to worry about the cares and the energies of this world, the non-essentials. But Mary, it says, she, Jesus says she's chosen the better portion, the good fruit. See, Martha let herself be choked out, but Mary allowed herself to receive the blessing. And we need to watch where we put our energies. Does it yield dividends? Are we getting a return from the time and energy we put into it? Is it building up our faith and our conviction, our steadfastness in the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, perhaps that is a worry or a concern or a problem or an anxiety we need to push aside. Next would be um, worrying about pleasing the wrong people is wrong. You've heard the expression, I'll just say it, I'd rather be a God pleaser than a man pleaser. And truly, that is where our conviction should be. That we are more concerned with how God looks at us rather than our coworker, a family, or a friend, or anyone for that matter that we stand on the truth, that we stand on our principles, that we walk this narrow road, and we care more about what God thinks of us than our fellow man. And you've heard that expression, you can't please all the people all the time. No matter how much you try to worry and try to please them, it's never going to happen. There's always going to be somebody who's going to wag that finger or not like what you do. And so we should worry about our Heavenly Father. And let me use that word worry. We should be concerned with, puzzle, and even put our mental energies into thinking how it is that God looks upon us rather than how our fellow man looks upon us, who is like grass, here today and gone tomorrow. So that being said, what is the cure for worry or this anxiousness that may be wrong? There's a couple of verses, 1 Peter 5, 7, which says, Cast all your cares upon him. And then the second one is Philippians 4, 6, which I just read. And I'm going to point something out in these verses. I don't know if you noticed this. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 
But then he says, but in everything, in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. The point to that being is that by willful steps, the believer seeks to engage in a way that lifts him heavenward, lifts him upward. It's almost like you might see in any other context in the world where we talk about giving ourselves a good pep rally or a good, you know, pulling up ourselves by our bootstraps. Well, this is the spiritual context of that. It means that we give thanks to the Lord and we enter into praise to him. And look what it does. It quickly changes the scales. Then maybe add prayer and supplication and again further changes the scales, except the bass won't allow it to go up anymore. The point being is, these are activities whereby we, the Christian, the followers of God, act in such a way that it lifts our spirit heavenward to praise God, to thank God, to be thankful of the things in our life, to seek Him and to worship Him. These are activities that lift us upwards rather than sitting in this pit of despair and gloom and agony, as the song says. Rather than closing the blinds of our heart and pulling down the shades of our mind and allowing ourselves to have a pity party and to fester that, but rather to trust God and to, and to engage in those activities that take our minds off of these worries, but rather place them in a proper context. And I will get to that in a moment. And by doing so, the God of peace will guard our hearts and our mind. So what are the proper things that we can worry? Because I said this is a, a double word in a sense. Ha there has to be balance. We as Christians should be concerned about things. Should have the, I guess in a sense, merima, this anxiousness. What are those ways? It is right that we should take thought of each other. Samuel says in 1 Samuel, that I will not sin against God for by neglecting to pray for you. See, caring for one another and bearing each other's burdens is a healthy way to listen to one another as we confess our sins and our, our errors and what we struggle with in our covenant groups or our cell groups or our, our band meetings. That we are able to speak with one another and to bear one another up. That is a good place to allow ourselves to be anxious, to say, Lord, I can't sleep right now. I am concerned about my pastor. Lord, I can't sleep right now. I'm concerned about my friend. Lord, I can't sleep right now. I'm concerned for my children. And to go into prayer, that is a proper thing to be concerned about or be anxious about. It's the same word, merimon, the same word that's used in, that Paul uses in this context, which brings us to our next one that we should be uh, concerned for one another. This is Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that there be, be no divisions among the body, but that the members should have the same care or merriman for one another. See, the Lord wants us to care for one another, to care and pray, to care and to intercede, to carry on one another's burdens. Meaning this, when you hear those prayer requests in church, Go home and pray for him. Don't let the pastor just do it and then forget about it. This isn't the old microwave, set it and forget it, or whatever the cooking device is on whatever channel it is on TV that sells you items at 12 o'clock at night. No, we are God's people and we uphold one another. So write down those prayer requests. Write down those people that are sick, those that need salvation, those that are looking for a job, those that need a touch from the Lord. Write those down. Take them with you. Put them in your Bible and close it. And when you go home to read, open it up and put your hand and pray for those needs. Bear one another's anxieties. Bear them on. Another way that we can have is the right way is to take thought for the church of Christ. And we can find that in uh, in first in second Corinthians 11:28 second Corinthians 11:28 I'm sorry I should have had myself already turned there 11:28 he says this 
And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure or merriment on me for, or sorry, pressure of me and my anxiety merriment for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not? Who may fall and I am not indignant? Paul says, I'm an apostle and I care for the churches. Do we pray for those brothers and sisters in China or Pakistan or El Salvador or in South America or or in South Africa, or in Kenya, or wherever they're being persecuted, they need a touch. They're being, in, they're being in prison. Even those Christians that are being persecuted, even in Canada, and I would dare say maybe even in America, if we would stand up for righteousness. We pray for God's church, that church that we're a part of. Whether it be Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal, it doesn't matter. Those people that are born again, saints of God, we uphold the church. And it is right that we bear this anxiety, this merriment for the needs of the ministry, that they can reach the poor, the lost, the sick, those that need Jesus Christ. And then finally, it is right to take the thought of the church of Christ. It is right to take the thought of, of the take the thought for the church of Christ. Paul's care for the churches was at once his burden and his privilege. The Christian will ever think and plan how best that he may serve the church. See, when we have this anxiety, this merriment for the church, we will look in our heart and say, Lord, how can I serve the church? Not only pray and intercede for my brothers and sisters, but how can I step up and move forth in the ministry of Jesus Christ? See, that is the proper way that we are to be anxious or merriment, not just simply the negative, which I already alluded to, but rather that we can have a proper balance. Not to say, no, we shouldn't have cares. Yes, we should have cares, but they should be properly distributed in our life, that we would be balanced as Christians. Well, thank you for take, allowing me to have this opportunity to speak to your heart. I pray that the Holy Spirit, uh, that the Holy Spirit spoke to you, and that you feel a sense of what maybe the Lord is asking you to do in your local church, how you are to pray for those in your life and those in the church and those outside the church. I hope you have a desire to do so. And if not, don't be anxious or worry. Simply pray and ask the Lord. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things prayer and supplication. And the God of peace will guard your minds and your hearts with that, what it says, that peace that passes all understanding. Thank you again for listening. May the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Go forth in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.